In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise be Jesus and Mary, now and forever. Dear brothers and sisters, today we celebrate the second class feast of Saint Anne, the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the grandmother of our Lord Jesus Christ. Saint Anne is the spouse of Saint Joachim, she is the patron saint of Canada, as well as the patron saint of unmarried women, of housewives, of women in labor, and for women who want to conceive. She is the patron saint of grandmothers and educators, and she is the patron of Brittany, and also the patron of the island of Alderney, which is one of the Channel Islands. So we see that St. Anne has a lot to offer. And I'd like to thank St. Anne for the times that she has interceded for me in my own life. And if anyone is familiar with a place in, Vo in London called Vauxhall, you find there a church dedicated to St. Anne. We are in the month dedicated to the precious blood of Jesus. And here in Portsmouth, in this church dedicated to St. Joseph, who is the patron of the Universal Church. I'd like to explain a bit the need to fight for the restoration of all that was lost in the church and in society. And I'd like to continue my thanksgiving in this month of July. Um, we once spoke about thanksgiving on the 5th the fifth, not only because of the fifth of July, the priestly ordination, but the fifth, meaning Camberwell Green, that's where I'm from. Um, I'd like to introduce myself here in St. Joseph's. And the fifth because Radio Immaculata and uh, a particular show called Building a Marian Culture has dedicated what it does to the five wounds of Jesus. And um, I went from a rough council estate in South London to the traditional Latin mass. In many ways, it was the Latin mass that saved me, and I am grateful to God for bringing me to the Latin mass. And I'm thankful for hearing many preachers in the Latin mass preach very strongly. And um, preachers like Father George Dangerfield, who would preach at Spanish Place in London, and I'm grateful for having met priests like Father Peter Lesseter, who was like a martyr for the traditional Latin Mass. And I'd like to continue my thanksgiving and extend it to St. Anne. I mention all of this because we have to be like martyrs in these times. And we pray to St. Anne to intercede for us and protect us. There is a devotion to St. Anne on Tuesdays, and many people find that devotion and prayer to St. Anne is very powerful. And the fruit of her womb is she who crushes the head of the serpent, Mary, the Immaculate Conception, born of St. Anne. In England, you had a feast called the Conception of St. Anne, which was basically the feast of the Immaculate Conception. So in England, there was this devotion to St. Anne. And as I mentioned, St. James's Spanish place in London, once we spoke about five things that we were aiming to go after, to go on the attack. One, modernism. Two, Freemasonry. Three, the rainbow flag revolution. Four, the decline in Marian devotion and five, immodesty, and the need to restore the dignity of the woman. I mention all of this because we hope to bring all of these discourses to a conclusion and to have something practical to offer, to say, we've done our talking, now we have to do action. And as Saint Anne is the patron saint of educators, 
And in the past, we've spoke about the dignity of the woman and her important role in society. We turn to Saint Anne and we place into the hands of Saint Anne this intention of restoring the dignity of the woman and helping women and girls to realize the important role they have. And this is why we have spoken against immodesty. This is one of the reasons why we've spoken about immodesty, because that important role will be forfeited if the woman loses their dignity through immodesty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall have their fill, Jesus told us. And this also means blessed are those who hunger and thirst for holiness. For in sacred scripture, justice is often synonymous with holiness. And the virtue of justice is the habit, that disposition of constantly, continuously giving to others what's due to them. And it's right to say that in many ways, women have not been given what's due to them. This does not mean the diabolical emancipation that the world is trying to give them. That is not what we're talking about. What it simply means is to acknowledge the woman's strength and her qualities. And in this world, there are many strong women. In today's epistle, you heard about the valiant woman. There are many women of virtue endowed with a soul that is noble enriched with many spiritual gifts, admirable women, pious women, strong women, virtuous women, inspirational women, with interior fortitude. This could be someone's mother. Your mother could be a strong woman. Your grandmother might be a strong woman. Your auntie might be a strong woman. Your wife might be a strong woman. Your sister might be a strong woman. Your cousin, your niece, your daughter, your neighbor, and so on. And how many strong men have come from a strong woman? And how many strong sons have come from a strong mother? So we've spoken about modesty because one of the things that weakens this role that the woman has in potentially restoring the society is this vanity, which many times is manifested in immodest dress. And immodesty jeopardizes and forfeits this potential role that the woman has in contributing towards a certain restoration, which we are all hoping for, this restoration. And through being dignified and virtuous, that's all it takes to begin this restoration. But if she abdicates from her role and loses some of the spiritual gifts that has been given to her through immodesty, we feel it important and a need to speak, to defend the woman. The saints spoke out against immodest dress and indecent fashions, for they knew how greatly it offended God and was harmful to one's neighbor. And if you are aware of what the Blessed Virgin Mary said to little Saint Jacinta about immodesty, how certain fashions will be introduced which will greatly offend God. And if you are aware of what the Blessed Virgin Mary told Venerable Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres about these current times and how in these times modesty will hardly be seen in women, you have to understand why now there is an urgent need to speak out against a modesty. But many are silent. And if you are aware of how the church used to speak and how the church, what lengths the church would go to, to defend modesty, you'd be surprised. And I'd like to read um, part of a letter published in 1930 from what is now called the Congregation of the Clergy. This was during the time of Pius IX. I quote, in order to facilitate 
the, divide, the desired effect to this sacred congregation by the mandate of the Most Holy Father, Pius XI, has decreed as followed. There are certain numbers, um, I'm not going to read all of them. One, the parish priest, and especially the preacher, when occasion arises, should, according to the words of the Apostle Paul, insist, argue, exhort, and command that feminine garb be based on modesty and womanly ornament be a defense of virtue. Let them likewise admonish parents to cause their daughters to cease wearing indecorous dress. Number seven, no, number two, parents conscious of their grave obligations towards the education, especially religious and moral, of their offspring, should see to it that their daughters are solidly instructed from earliest childhood in Christian doctrine, and they themselves should assiduously inculcate in their souls by word and example love for the virtues of modesty and chastity. Number seven. It is desirable that pious organization of women be founded, which by their counsel, example, and propaganda should combat the wearing of apparel unsuited to Christian modesty and should promote purity of customs and modesty of dress. And I'll read one more, number nine. Maidens and women dressed immodestly are to be debarred from Holy Communion and from acting as sponsors at the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. Further, if the offense be extreme, they may even be forbidden to enter the church. This is 1930. And what, is, what are the fashions like now? So you see the mind of the church and what was at the heart of the church in those times? And this is why we speak. But dear brothers and sisters, as I mentioned, we hope to bring to a conclusion um, talking about things and putting things into practice. So we propose that just as pious organization of women should be encouraged in promoting modesty, we'd like to promote and encourage those women who want to start modest clothing lines and who want to make them available on the market, we want to encourage and promote this. Now is your time, those who have these initiatives, to come forward and your undertakings will be blessed by God. And this is how we hope to bring to a conclusion um, our talking on this matter and put into practice by hopefully, through the grace of God, um, helping others to put modest clothing on the market. Finally, let us contemplate the statues and images of St. Anne, which has an image of little Mary. And let us imitate little Mary, all of us, little Mary or infant Mary or the child Mary. St. Anne will give to us this grace to be like little Mary, taking instruction from her mother. And just as she took instruction from her mother, we know she was all holy, the Immaculate Conception, but she took instruction from her mother. Let us take instruction from our mother Mary and imitate little Mary, being educated by our mother, the Immaculate Conception. So that in imitating Mary and being instructed by our mother, Mary will instruct us and teach us her way of littleness and humility. For the restoration will come about in our times through this humility. To you, Saint Anne, we entrust all of our endeavors and we humbly ask you to pray for us. Saint Anne, the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary and grandmother of our Lord, Jesus Christ, pray for us. Saint Anne, patron saint of educators, help us to educate this new generation and educate them in the ways of modesty and chastity. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.